No, I, I agree. I, the government should never be in the business of settlement itself. And um, I threw a, side, a slide up there. The frontiers are opened by people with the support of or in spite of their governments. And, and, I, and I believe that. Um, however, there is an enabling function that can occur um, that near frontier, far frontier model can apply to technologies as well. And there are certain technologies that the government may want to use for the ability to operate its base on the moon or Mars, ISRU type stuff, um, that can then cross feed into what is usable to support private sector development, i.e. the economic driver of settlement. So those two can work together. Um, I think part of the reason that we've seen the, the, the Antarctic issue goes beyond the relationship between the NSF function and the tourism function, and that has to do with the international treaty side of things because you're not looking at resource utilization and those types of things. We haven't dealt with that, but that's outside of the relationship between the U.S. government and the U.S. people as far as the interaction between science and exploration and settlement. I do believe there are ways that the government, when we go into space, uh, I have a, a, an idea I play with sometimes called catalytic, um, catalytic contracting, where uh, NASA might say that we, we want to a HAB module on the moon um, that's got 10,000 square feet. Um, and you'll actually be awarded if uh, th there's an economic reward built in if you make it for 15,000 feet. And you can use the extra 5,000 for anything you want. Um, and the life support system needs to support 10 people. But if you go ahead and build it for 15 to 20 and you've got that other part, then you can do that with anything you want. Um, and we'll buy that from you, you know, after you demonstrate it in the Mojave or somewhere, um, or out in the Sahara, um, uh, or downtown LA, you know, which is pretty well an intellectual desert. Um, but <laughs> you, you, can, you can then take that um, contract, and this moves outside of NASA, you get into other parts of the government where you'll get a zero GZ, zero tax write-off. What you're trying to do is get over into the black so that when you present this to your investors, or your stockholders in your company, you're trying to do an additive. Oh, by the way, you get to use the meatball, you know, because we serve NASA on the moon. So you add all these up and get a cash value out of it to the point where you can take it to your stockholders and say, ah, now we're doing that. Now, that's helped you get across the costs of your R&D and your development and your proving your capability, and you've got a few thousand feet extra where your, your, uh, your people can go into that same module or system on the moon. And now you can go build a second one down the street, and maybe it's going to be tourism, maybe it's going to be whatever. Um, another quick one I want to toss out is uh, Bob Richards and I, for a few years, have been playing around with the idea of the, the dual base concept, that if you're going to train explorers to go um, to Mars, human explorers, and you don't want to mix up those two functions in the actual facility, the exploration function and all of that, with the community building settlement function, then you do two bases. You do a base on the far side, you know, where, the, where the, the poor astronauts are over there, out of sight of the Earth, with built-in time delays and this and that, as if they're simulating Mars, and they're doing all of that stuff. And your support base is on the near side and is operating um, as the, in a community sense, in that you've got all your support people supporting your astronauts who are practicing Mars on the far side which is, again, a pure government function base. There doesn't have to be any private sector involvement at all in that one. But all these other kinds of uh, contracts and all these other ways of leveraging off the private sector are being applied on the near side support base so that you get the best of both worlds. Just an idea. Go ahead. I got a question on the, uh, let me wow. read it. The question is, uh, what experiments would you put on a lunar lander? Where on the moon would you send it? Well, the experiment that I would put on a lunar lander is a plant growth module. And where I would send it would be the easiest place that the engineers would land it. I'd be happy with an equatorial site and doing a 14-day growth mission. I'd be happy with a polar site and doing a lower light, longer mission. So uh, to me, the important point would be grow a plant on the moon. That's, uh, that's what I'd like to do. I, mine would probably be a rover um, that could, do, could look for molecular uh, water or uh, something like that. 
but could operate in the sort of the cryo temperatures in the shadows of the South and North Pole and see if it could operate, go in and do a successful experiment, something like that. But I like the, I like the flower in the moon.